to the, the Wilson Center and welcome to our discussion today on securing the third pole, science, conservation, and community resilience in Asia's high mountains. So this never happens to me. Saturday, I went to the farmer's market and I had a neighbor, colleague, and friend come up to me and said, oh, Monday, you're doing that Snow Leopards event. I'm coming. <laughs> so I'm glad that, that Judy Oglethorpe is here. Because she's a WWF and recently from Nepal and a neighbor and long-term friend and colleague. But it's good to be among friends and colleagues and some new uh, faces to discuss um, an important topic on Global Snow Leopard Day. So happy Global Snow Leopard Day. Um, many of you are familiar with the Wilson Center. My name is Roger Mark D'Souza, and I direct our programs on global sustainability and resilience here at the Center. And the Center serves as a living memorial to President Wilson, really engaging on issues of international development importance and looking at what's happening on the ground, what's innovative, what's new, what's practical, and what it means for programs and policies. So I'm really pleased that we can co-host today event together with USAID, WWF, and the Charis uh, Project. I know many of you uh, um, have seen some of the materials on the Charis Project that's outside there, the contribution to high Asia runoff from ice and snow. There are some materials and a fact sheet out there, so please be sure to, to get that. As we look at the combination of these uh, projects together, we're really pleased that many of them highlight and exemplify what can be achieved when we work across sectors and focus on integrated results. And I'm particularly pleased in thinking about today's event that we talk a little bit about community resilience. Just last week, uh, we hosted a Resilience Week at the Center. So this very much builds on the discussions and engagement that we have been having here most recently. I'm particularly pleased that we're going to have uh, our comments from Kate Newman to kick us off. Uh, many of you are familiar with Kate. She's the Vice President for Public Sector Initiatives at WWS Forest and Freshwater um, Program. She looks at the forest and freshwater goals, and she specializes in large-scale conservation planning and policy support in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. She's currently working with teams in Bhutan, Nepal, Myanmar, Cambodia, Mozambique, and Colombia on integrated landscape, green economy, and sustainable infrastructure planning. So Kate, a warm welcome, and I hand it over to you. Happy Snow Leopard Day, everybody. Let's get a picture of a snow leopard going on here. Ready? All right. There it is. Spectacular. Today we're here to celebrate one of the most beautiful of all cats, and there are some tiger people in the audience, so calm down. <laughs> Sorry. But honestly, seriously, um, it's become a symbol. That's why we're here in a way. It's become a symbol of beauty and strength and peace across a wide range of nations that I'll show you a map of in a moment. They're roaming the countries of some of the fastest growing economies on Earth. And that is drawing us all up into their spectacular habitat that they share with some of the local communities living at the extreme edges of our vertical habitat, so to speak, for human beings at the top ranges of the mountains. For people who live in these regions, snow leopards are a creature of power and mystery. They're iconic for many countries. They inspire both awe and fear. A snow leopard can spring out of nowhere, bring down an animal twice its own size, and that does make you afraid if you're walking up there. But at the same time, it has this kind of rare kind of ethereal beauty and elegance that draws the admiration and attention of people both across its own range but around the world. But snow leopards are facing an increasing threat, many increasing threats, as, they habi as their habitat shifts for climate change, development brings people closer, leading to conflicts and overall stress. And these communities are fast becoming the frontline witnesses to the impacts of our evolving climate. Change is everywhere where snow leopards live. 
that's a bit dark, but it was a splendid sight. So they call these ghosts of the mountains for good reason. Hardly anybody ever actually sees them, but I wanted to try. Mary Melnick, who you'll hear from shortly, and a few of us went up to Mongolia to try to see the snow leopard. And spoiler alert right now, we totally failed. But we did make a good effort. And we also wanted to go visit the communities that live up there, the participants in the Asia High Mountains Project that the US Agency for International Development has been funding and being implemented by WWF and a number of partners who you're going to hear from today. So we visited a family on the Sire Mountain. This is their uh, ecotourism enterprise, and it really is the only set of dwellings that we saw for many, many, many hours as we drove. The small yurts are in this spectacular environment, um, and they're setting up a tourism industry, a tourism business for themselves as an adaptation strategy that will help them reduce their dependence on the overstressed grazelands that are basically everything you can see except those snow, snow top peaks. And this is the first view of our camp, and we were just mesmerized, absolutely spectacular. But I'd say that one of the coolest parts of this trip for me was talking with the local residents about how they've agreed to close off important habitat for ibex, one of the critical species, prey species for the snow leopard. And that means basically halting the progress or the use of these sheep of ibex habitat up closer into the mountain range. Then they had their mountain officially declared as a legal protected area, a local legal protected area by the provincial government. This was a really big deal for them because grazing sheep and yak and goats are the center of their economies, both for their cash requirements and their own subsistence. And in this harsh environment, there really aren't that many other options. So we had a wonderful conversation with this gentleman and his wife, who were the elder family uh, in, this, in this group using this area. And we sat in front of the fence that's part of the project that basically keeps the sheep here and allows the ibex to live where they live naturally, up behind and into the mountains. It now closes, closes off this very high valley that goes up into the mountains and the favored slopes for the ibex as they come moving around. And they're very proud to tell us about how that project's been going. But on top of that, on the other side of the fence, just behind the gentleman, he told us that he puts his own, pays for and puts salt out every month for the ibex himself. And at dawn, they stream down in a big group from the mountainside, enjoy their treat nearly every day, we were lucky enough to see them, and these are the little youngins that are taking the last bit before their parents call them up the mountain. And I asked them, why, why did you do that? That's like your own expense for the sake of the ibex or, or the snow leopard. And he said, no, no, I just like all animals. All animals are the same to me. My domesticated animals are the same as these wild animals that I live with. And so I felt humbled by what he said. He was actually not particularly wealthy, but was using some of his own resources to make sure that the ibex were living comfortably. And as he said, they were not afraid, and they'd come every day when they needed their, their little bit of salt. And so I feel like with this love of the environment, with his entrepreneurial spirit, this community is going to live in harmony in this environment no matter how the change occurs, an environment that they love and respect in spite of these changes. So just to place us today, the snow leopards are an amazing, uh, they they're found in this amazing contiguous arc that goes from, say, Nepal down all the way up through Mongolia, through Central Asia, 12 countries involved. And they are home to many, many of these montane people who move around to take advantage of the grassland. So the, the life of the snow leopard is intimately intertwined with the lives of the people in these high mountains. These 12 countries include powerhouses like China, where most of the snow leopards reside, and Russia and India. These are the growing economies I was talking about, along with the rest who are coming on right behind. These animals stride along the peaks of all these mountains that are also the headwaters for some of the most important rivers in the world. 
in terms of providing clean flowing river to millions downstream all across Asia and Central Asia. But fortunately, the complexity of this has not been lost on this community of governments. All 12 countries have joined the Global, the global Snow Leopard Ecosystem Program, GSLEP, which just had its second high-level event just this past August to reiterate the needs and their commitment. And this is the front row, and you can see the different cultures in the faces of the leaders who attended this meeting. We will talk more about that today, that wonderful togetherness, which is emulated in the SDGs in a really important way of addressing things and basically having a peaceful, iconic creature like the snow leopard bringing countries together that can't usually talk about things very comfortably is a wonderful aspect of this program. Finally, I'd like to say uh, to Mary in front, thank you very much to USAID for these past five years. They've made a fundamental difference with their investments to conservation and human livelihoods across this region. And basically together with partners like these and the countries working together, we're setting a foundation for the future, a future where resilient communities are adapting to change, where snow leopards continue to find prey, and roam free of encroaching infrastructure and development, and where water, most important perhaps, continues to flow steady and clean into the rivers that bind these beautiful mountains to the communities and ecosystems below. So now with the rest of the panel this morning, this afternoon, we're gonna go dig deeper into many of the topics I brought up today, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen. If we could invite the panelists to, to please come up um, and we get started, thank you. So Kate has, has uh, painted a compelling picture for us of both visually and in terms of the key points that she was making. And I'm pleased that she ended by talking about resilient communities, water, and snow leopards. So Richard Armstrong is going to uh, take up that a little bit to frame the discussion um, through a brief overview of the importance of High Asia as a water tower. And Richard is a senior research scientist at the University of Colorado at the National Slow and Ice Data Center. And he's currently a principal investigator for the USAID Charis Project, which we've mentioned before. Um, so Richard, I'll hand it over to you. Oh, sorry. Am I, am I interfering with my, with your good work down there? <coughs> First, I'd just like to say thank you very much for everyone involved in this uh, event for inviting me to be here in spite of the fact that I don't have any wonderful stories to tell about <coughs> leopards or lions. But uh, I can tell you something about the environment and the common ground here is uh, a two-way thing. One is perhaps most importantly the, U the USAID funding uh, via Mary Melnick, which we very much appreciate. Um, and the other is the geogra geographic region that overlaps <coughs> almost entirely, the Charis Project that I'll talk about in a moment overlaps almost entirely with the uh, snow leopard study region. So the leopards, uh, as the sort of uh, guardians of the headwaters of, of, of the mountains of high Asia, uh, the, the common ground here is that uh, the large glaciers and extensive snow cover uh, are predominant in the upper uh, watersheds of this region. Uh, this, the project itself is a uh, Located at the University of Colorado, it, it, it's a collaborative effort to assess the role of glaciers and seasonal snow cover in the hydrology of the mountains of high Asia, known as the Charis Project. I'm the PI, and uh, we have an Asian project manager, Rijan Kayash, at Kathmandu University that some of you may know. And the group below is a, is a whole array of people that Mary knows, but the, the Boulder crowd, uh, everything from senior scientists to graduate students and postdocs. So the region we cover in terms of this uh, contribution to high Asian runoff from ice and snow, uh, it's five major river basins, Ganges, Indus, Brahmaputra, Amur Darya, Sir Darya. 
uh, totaling around 3 million square kilometers. Something new for me, I'm typically familiar with studying one glacier, and now I'm looking at 3 million square kilometers. You see on the map there uh, the, ba the large basins, uh, and the uh, light blue color is the consistent seasonal snow cover, and the dark blue are the glacierized areas, not easy to see on the map, but to give you some idea of the area coverage in the four basins. Uh, the project concept uh, is basically that we really can't look forward to what's going to be happening in the future. We can't look at uh, possible future scenarios unless we have a better idea of local and current conditions. We need to know spatial and temporal patterns of the various water sources, and, and for our responsibility, <clears throat> that's, that's snow and ice. So projecting forward is, uh, relies on a better understanding of current conditions. Uh, the project goals for CHARS basically are to apply remote sensing data to achieve this goal because of such a large area, we're not studying one glacier or one small region. So we're estimating the amount, uh, timing, and spatial patterns of the melt from both seasonal snow and ice. It's the first time these two things have really been separated, which is not easy to do, but we're doing that with <coughs> satellite remote sensing. Uh, obviously, they're playing a key role for downstream irrigation, hydropower, and, and general consumption. Um, we collaborate with Asian partners. Uh, in doing so, we recognize common goals and share methods and, and data and compare our results. The chart, we have uh, 11 partner institutions. These are uh, collaborations by way of um, official cooperative agreements between the University of Colorado and each one of these uh, organizations here. And <clears throat> they're mutual two-way benefits. They benefit by participating in just because of the communication among these groups, many of these people, uh, for example, good in, a good example, India and Pakistan hadn't been that much together in the same room until the Charles Project. Uh, and, and the trade-off is for them, I mean, the advantage for them is we fund some of their field work in order to obtain field measurements that we use to validate our, our melt model. Uh, and a, a, an additional advantage for them is not just that we fund some of the field research, but the fact that uh, We've offered uh, training workshops in terms of glaciology, hydrology, uh, remote sensing. So training workshops combined with the support we've given to nine different students at Kathmandu University where there's a master's degree program in glaciology. So we have nine graduates from that program uh, from uh, a few of these nations, not all of them. Uh, just so you can see uh, some faces for a change instead of just figures and diagrams. This is a picture f uh, of our group. Um, it was actually uh, meeting in 2016 in Almaty, Kazakhstan. Uh, we were outside on a field trip uh, gathered around in, in a museum. Our most recent meeting was Nagarkot, Nepal, April 2017. Uh, I'm happy to say that every one of these annual meetings, every one of the 11 institutions <coughs> has participated. Uh, back to the, p the region, just to get a feeling for where, where the glaciers are. I uh, won't go into too much detail here, but uh, looking at the map and looking at the basins, again, if you look at the full basins on the left, you see the Indus Basin, uh, and that's the glacierized area in square kilometers. It has more glacierized area than all the other bison, or almost more than all the other basins combined. So Upper Indus is very sig significant in terms of water flow from melting glaciers. Uh, so what does it really look like? Uh, the quickest way to do this, I thought, was put in some pie charts, annual mean contribution of snow, ice, and rainfall <coughs> to run off from the full Charis basins. It's for the period for which we have the satellite data we're relying on, 2001 to 2015. Uh, so you s clearly in the, in the pie charts see the importance of, <coughs> in the green, snow on land, and the gray rainfall, and you go, well, where's the exposed glacier ice and snow on ice? It's there but it's small amounts uh, because we're looking at these full basins and you can see that they, uh, the, the area covered by snow and ice is relatively small. So from that, what's the, what's the big picture? What are the, the points from that? From the, from the full five basins, we see that uh, in the west, in the Sirdari, Amadari, and Indus, uh, there's about one to five percent total runoff from snow and ice. And uh, I'm fi I mean from glacier ice. And contribution from snow on land is, is significant, as you can see in the pie, pie charts in the west. And in the, in the east, in the, the Ganges, there's approximately 5% uh, from snow on land, mainly because that region is dominated by the monsoon and has larger uh, <coughs> areas at lower elevations. Uh, then in the Brahmaputra, the last bullet, there's significant contribution from snow on land, mainly because uh, even though they're sometimes lumped together, the Brahmaputra basin has a much higher mean elevation. 
So let's look at something that's maybe more relevant to where this uh, water is stored and also where the snow leopards live, live for that part. For that. Look at the same pie charts for uh, runoff from ice and snow and exposed glacier ice, snow on ice, exposed glacier ice, and snow on land and rainfall in these five basins, but just from three to 6,000 meters or around 10,000 to 20,000 feet above. Then we start to see, uh, as we constrain it to that higher elevation band, we see, again, the distribution of how this works across the regions, probably 10 to 15 percent uh, in the Sirdari, Amurdari, and Indus, what I call, I'm calling the West. Uh, and then in, in the more monsoon-dominated areas of <clears throat> the Ganges and the Brahmaputra, we can see that, that the, 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 the amounts go up as we look at the higher elevations, but still a fairly small amount compared to the amount of water available, again, dominated by the summer monsoon. So the basic conclusions are that, uh, the pro as you would expect, the primary contribution from glacier ice melt across this region is consistently June, July, and August, the summer melt months. The contribution from glacier ice melt is significant in, in Western High Asia, about 15 to 20 percent, but less significant in the eastern regions, probably less than 5 percent. In general, uh, snow melt contributes 10 times more water than glacier ice melt in all of these regions in, in general terms. Uh, the good news is that uh, just looking at the last 15 years, there's no statistically significant change in the amount of snow extent over these regions. And just a few <clears throat> points to leave you with. Uh, you hear frequent media reports of rapidly melting glaciers, and, and they're factual, <clears throat> but the problem with, the problem, with the problem with glaciers are melting is that they melt ev every year during the melt season, uh, unless you happen to be living in an ice age. But they uh, typically refer to a, a sample of glaciers just at the lowest elevations. Those are the ones that are more typically studied because they're more accessible. Uh, and then they extrapolate to the higher elevations, which is, which is a false thing to do. Uh, the lowest elevations of the glaciers in high mountain Asia are generally above the highest elevations of the glaciers in North America and Europe that many of you are, are more familiar with. So it's an environment, you know, 16 to 25,000 feet that uh, is a totally new environment to those of us who have been studying glaciers in North America and Europe. Um, under current conditions, under current climate conditions, uh, <clears throat> the highest elevations of these glaciers are, are simply n not melting. But with increased, increased global warming, uh, obviously things will change. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. So we're now going to move to uh, Ghana Gorong from a herd in the high mountains of Upper Mustang, Nepal, to a conservationist. He has dedicated more than two decades of his life to nature and to its conservation, uh, specifically looking at improving livelihoods of local communities. He's currently the Senior Conservation Program Director at WWF Nepal, where he's responsible for developing and managing WWF's conservation programs, projects, and relationships with national and international partners. So uh, Ghana is going to be telling us a little bit of his perspective from the local and, and field uh, dimension. So Ghana, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, a very happy Global Snow Leopard Day. So that is the land of the glaciers and water towers at the place where I was born. What do you think about the landscape? It's pretty nice. It's a good one. This nice landscape is a pretty harsh climatic conditions that people like us who grew up as a herder had to endure lots of pain and struggle to make a mere living out of this space that you are given by birth. As a result, we do a lot of things. One of the livelihood options that we had, and still we have, is the little green patch that you can see. We can grow crops, potatoes, and cereals. That doesn't last more than a few months, a year. So the option is to migrate in the winter to lowlands of Nepal, as far as India, and these days all the way to Europe and America. And we still continue what survival gives you the best option that you have to has offer and you have to move on with it. And the biggest option that we had was the livestock. We call the option as cash in the bank. 
That's what brings money into our lives and support our livelihoods. The place you see here, this is the exact place where I was born 52 years back. And these are the same goods that my grandfather, my father, myself, and still my brother and his children continue to herd. And what happens? As a young boy, between the age of 5 to 10, this little cave, I was trained as a Buddhist practitioner where we respect all forms of life, interdependent, interconnectedness among life forms were taught from early age. Yet, as my father was hurting until the age of 80, he passed away two years back. No matter how much being taught philosophically, the known killing is the way to go. It made us pretty angry. A very, very angry boy when our livestock were killed. Threatened our livelihoods. And he did not kill only little goats and sheep. In dozens, tens, and eights, and twenties times, in a, when it enters in corral, it killed even more. It did also kill a big yak, horses and mule, that cost in today's price is $1,000. In $1,000, in poor countries, in mountain communities, you can buy a lot. A, lo a loss of one animal is loss of your economy, cash in the bank. Then that's how it ends up. It is retaliatory killing. People retaliate. And recently there's poaching on it. And this is the particular uh, issue that is very close to my heart. As a young boy, fighting with the snow leopards for survival, getting a bit of education, learning more ecology and understanding of the environment as umbrella species on the mountains for the ecosystem services. And finally, digging the root cause, how you're going to solve that problem. It's the only way of minimizing the conflict is the primary factor that will ensure the survival of the snow leopards. And that's one of the reasons I, I have chose to work on it to the best I could with the communities I have, with the institutional support that I have. And it's not only the conflict that is threatens the snow leopard and its habitat. It's climate change. Brings extreme weathers, harsh winters. These are the nice field that I used to roam once upon a time. A much more grass is taller, greener, and now it's so much degraded. Many households had a sheep and goats. Now not more households. I mean, majority don't have it anymore. That's the one you see, the last yak herder. We, many of us had a yak. Now there's only one family keeps a yak because pastures are denuded so much that you can't keep anymore. Then you have to move these goats up and down. And it's not only the goat livestock that constitutes the food for snow leopard, as low as 15% to as high as 40% plus. So losing a livestock means losing snow leopard food. And also competition with the uh, uh, wild prey. And you look at the conditions of the blue, sh blue sheep, which is primary food. It's very pathetic. It's loss of grassland is a major part. And it's not only wildlife and ecosystem that suffers. It's people suffers a lot. The, my own villages have to re resettle from this top, the loss of water resources, all the way to riverbeds planting little apples as part of the adaptation measures. The apples were grown on the size of cherry 40 years back. Now you can grow a pretty good sized apples, a juicy one. Anyone you can visit can have an apple. But still, when you look at that, this little settlement can be washed away at any time with one fresh flood. Will not take too much time. And the road is coming up. I will not say too much threat on it. But still, the China's one belt, one road, the major nine roads going through Nepal. And this one of the primary snow leopard habitat. It mm -hmm. goes through. So that's going to bring more people, more pressure on resources. And it's possibility of having trade, poaching, 
are always next to you as a threat. So ladies and gentlemen, the protecting mountain ecology is not only protecting mountains itself. As Richard has showed you, that the glacier melt, the water regulation having impact on the billions downstream. If you don't do right on the top, it's going to be a real pretty miserable at the bottom. And this is just the three months back. One day rain, intensive rain, that washed so many. And you look at the figures, yeah? over 300,000 households lost their livelihoods to a great extent. So here, this is snow leopard range where snow leopards been roaming and they still continue to roam. And these dots, you could say the, the, these are the landscapes which Gustav is going to talk about. The 12 range countries have decided to have a 13 landscapes where snow leopards can be secured for longer term. And Nepal has been one of the front-running countries, always in conservation. So out of 23, Nepal has designated three landscapes covering all the northern mountains of Nepal, sharing border with China and India here on two sides, and the central one with China. So it needs a lot of transboundary cooperation. Do you, any of you see where the snow leopard is? It's pretty, huh? It's pretty hard to see. That's why it is hard to prepare a plan. The plan has been drafted. So the first plan, the global plan, has been launched as Eastern Nepal in the Bishkek summit. So it's created a good news globally and nationally. It encouraged a loss, lot, people like me, in the conservation sector. So the plan is pretty much based. It's a blueprint for the rest of the range states. And it's pretty much based on the local knowledge. People like Himali, who is the, a Sherpa, a local citizen scientist, trained so much with, with capacity building and investment that many came from the USAID funding, the AJS High Mountain. Trapping, camera trapping, as high as close to 6,000 meters high. Collecting scats for genetic analysis. Monitoring the snow leopard, helping them to radio collar, put a GPS collar so you can track them and doing so much of that. And we have found very interesting, when the snow leopards are not going all the way to close to 6,000 meters, it is traveling a lot. And this particular patch, we see a more greenery, a two and a half year female that travels between Nepal and China, over 2,000 kilometers. There's another one, travels to India and Nepal, back and forth, 1,000 kilometers. So it's pretty much, unless we do a transboundary cooperation between the states, the protecting snow leopard is almost impossible. And that has been discussed and pretty much agreed in the global forum, as been referred to. Countries don't normally sit side by side to talk too much in, in political terms, but when talk of the snow leopard as ambassador, they're all happy to be together. So it's not all about ecology of conservation for snow leopards, it's about community. The community holds key to survival of the species. And we have invested a lot with building capacity for governance of natural resources, bring awareness. And there's a little things that can make a huge difference in the community's life. A little plastic tunnel, I call it greenhouse, where you can grow vegetables a lot for your nutritional intake, and also sell the surplus to the trackers and makes good income. Protecting watersheds for irrigation of limited field where you can only grow potatoes, which he, Sherpa was growing a few potatoes, little few animals, and running a tea house. So you have the combination of all the options. You can be, call it adaptation, or you can call it mere survival strategies. And for us, these are the women who have been key, central to our success, working shoulder to shoulder with the man as a citizen scientist creating, making functioning of the community-based snow leopard insurance scheme set up to compensate the losses of livestock. Educating girls for the last 15 years, these ladies have educated more than 200 girls, otherwise would have never been, uh, had access to education. And running income generation activities from separate uh, finance cooperatives 
And these are the really great stories that we have to tell. And finally, we do lots of good things, but we hardly document them. So this is part of the documenting the past, what has been done, what has been achieved, the present where we are, and the future where we're going to go. In Nepal, the Prime Minister himself has committed additional resources for snow leopard conservation. So this also book has been launched in Bishkek. So I would like to end here. The basically, the snow leopard work in Nepal has been a great success in terms of bringing populations up in the places where it was doing well because we had a support from all forms, from all walks of life, from governments like USAID. We have a global environment facilities. We have been like a celebrities like Leonardo DiCaprio and Megan Fox from US tweeting for the campaign. So all those are more important. And then there's more important part is local communities supporting us. The local government is supporting us. And mostly, the people who never see any, an, an, a snow leopard, but is still supporting us. And this is the man, 80-year-old man, who, who sends me a card saying, I shall never see your country, let alone a snow leopard. But I'm glad to be supporting the vital work that you do. <coughs> and this kind of postcards makes our energy going. No matter how hard it is, it makes us to continue. And then people like us are here to track. If we don't see them, we track the park mark. As, soon, as long as we see the park marks on the snow, we know they are there. And that is the only way we can ensure is the snow leopard is the one that's not working for. We're working for ourselves. The good system that it provides us is for us. So survival of the snow leopard is more important for our own survival than a species per se or for the snow leopard itself. So with this, I would like to thank you all and end here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gan. A really compelling set of stories about Snow Leopard as ambassador, Snow Leopard as connection uh, to community, and Snow Leopard insurance scheme at multiple levels. So thank you very much. So Ghana mentioned uh, Kustav Sharma, who is who has been involved in active research and conservation for about 15 years. Since 2007, he has been working with the Snow Leopard Trust in Seattle as a senior research ecologist. And since 2014, he has taken an additional responsibility as the international coordinator of the Global Snow Leopard and Ecosystems Protection Program, whose secretariat is based in Bishkek. So, um, Kustub is going to tell us a little bit about how to scale up the great field work that's being done and how we put that and contextualize that in a regional um, approach. So, uh, Kustub, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. What an honor it is to be here with you all today on the International Snow Leopard Day. From the President of the Kyrgyz Republic to the Vice President of Afghanistan, from the Deputy Speaker, Ministers, and senior officials represent, representing all the 12 Snow Leopard Range countries, to the, to the Secretary General of the United Nations, from the heads of international organizations such as UNEP, WWF, and so on, to celebrities cumulatively engaging with more than 50 million people from across the world. This August saw one of the most remarkable and biggest aggregations of some very influential people in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. These people included business leaders from some of the biggest industries who are otherwise seen uh, on the other side of the fence when we talk wildlife conservation. Five years ago, if you would have asked me, I would have perhaps laughed and rolled my eyes in disbelief that such a level of support can, be, can ever be generated for snow leopards. It's thanks to some, it's, th it's thanks to the leadership of people such as the President of the Kyrgyz Republic or the Prime Minister of Nepal Today, the GSLEP program, the Global Snow Leopard and Ecosystem Protection Program, is one of the most 
formidable alliances, formid formidable global alliances of countries, donor partners, international organizations, researchers, and conservationists coming together for snow leopard conservation. In fact, as Ghana just mentioned, it is the only platform in the whole world where these two, where these 12 countries come together and agree upon issues re related to the snow leopard conservation. But why should countries care? Why should donors bother about snow leopard conservation? Because people need water. People need water as much as they need air, uh, fodder for livestock, as much as they need uh, biomass, and tens of other ecosystem services that these mountains provide. Countries care because extreme events are on the rise from a, from a, from a higher frequency of occurrence of Zud, which kills tens of thousands of livestock at a greater frequency now, to flash floods in places like Pakistan where they had never occurred before. The, uh, the climate is hurting economies and it's hurting them bad. Because development doesn't need to be destructive. Local communities need development, but it does not have to be destructive. There are alternatives there. Because mountains have an ambassador, a species that roams two million square kilometers individuals roaming thousands of kilometers, as Ghana just mentioned, and that too across borders, crossing borders without passports or visas. Snow leopards are the true ambassadors of the mountains, not just true ambassadors, they are also the thermometers of the health of these ecosystems. Countries care because threats to the snow leopards are not reducing. In fact, they're intensifying and diversifying. Just for example, Mining and poorly planned infrastructure were not, were not even listed as key threats in 2003 when the Snow Leopard Survival Strategy was put together. Flip the pages of the survival strategy that was uh, prepared in 2014 and you'll see them listed in the top 10 threats. Countries care because we don't even know how many there are. It might sound ironical, but we really don't the best figures of snow leopard populations that we, ha that we have today are at best guesstimates. With less than 2% of the total habitat ever sampled, and that too biased towards the best habitats, we really are dealing with guesstimates here of how many snow leopards are there in the world. In 2013, uh, the Kyrgyz government, the Kyrgyz president, convened uh, a global forum, which is when the GSLEP program was spawned. This was the first time 12 countries came together to discuss snow leopard conservation, and many skeptics at that point may have written it off as a one-off event. Had it not been the continuation that it has been provided with, the resources that have been generated, or the, uh, the support that the program has generated in the last four years, it now means that it, it, it clearly exemplifies that we mean business here. Be it securing, a beat delineating 23 landscapes to be secured until 2020, or cre creating climate smart management plans, one of them Gana just showed a picture of. It's the countries who are taking the lead. It's the countries who are taking the ownership, and which is why I always say that we are doing nothing. It's the countries who are taking the program further. They're the ones who are the true owners of the GSLEP program. Whether it's scaling up action, uh, the activities that Ghana just mentioned, whether it's capacity building, economic valuation of ecosystem services, or scaling up of research and conservation programs, the monumental support, the monumental ownership that countries have shown has been phenomenal. Just to underscore here, none of this, and I repeat, none of this would have been possible had it not, had it not been for the support of some of the core partners of the GSLEP program, including USAID, UNDP, WWF, Snow Leopard Trust, and others. Many of you I can see here in the audience as well. Keeping in mind that snow leopards cannot vote, it's for us to be able to build a constituency for the snow leopards through engaging with people, through engaging with the public. That is the need of the day, and that's where we are very grateful to some of our celebrity ambassador supporters who are helping with the cause. 
I thought I'll end my presentation with a boring looking slide, but then I decided against it because it wouldn't do justice to this charismatic species. Uh, well, you can just see a train of snow leopards there. Anyway, look up. The work done equation in physics means force into displacement. The kind of work that people like Ghana here and others who are here uh, are doing, in fact, the work that organizations are doing, that's a lot of displacement. But the kind of momentum we need, the kind of weight we need, is something that governments can provide. It's the uh, it's, it's the change in governance, it's the impact of governance, or it's the scaling up of these activities from the level at which you're making a difference to a level where it can, it can make a global change. That's what is needed. And essentially, what we are trying to do is scale it up, scale the activities from the local scale to a higher scale, and make the work done, the work done of conserving snow leopards and their mountain ecosystems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gustav. I think some important words around engagement, displacement, and weight, and how we pull those together for scaling up. So Mary Melnick, um, it, it, it all comes back to Mary. <laughs> so Mary is the engagement, um, the environmental security and resilience team leader for USAID's Asia Bureau, 27 years of experience working in community development, biodiversity, conservation, and environment throughout Latin America and Asia. She's currently engaged in USAID efforts to address water security, glacier melt, and the conservation of tigers and snow leopards in Asia. And Mary's going to help us pull all of this together a little bit tell us a little bit more about how it comes together and some of the next steps uh, moving forward. So Mary, I hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us in this celebration of International Snow Leopard Day. I'd also like to thank the Wilson Center for hosting this important session. As Mark mentioned, my role here is to summarize uh, where we've been, where we are, and where we're going and particularly from the perspective of USAID, why we're involved as an organization. So first off, where have we been? Actually, I'd like to recognize the Wilson Center and the Environmental Security and Change Project because all of this work actually began with a collaboration with the center in 2008 called Asia's Future, Critical Thinking for a Changing Environment. From that analysis, um, we found that the low-hanging fruit of simple solutions to the world's development challenges are fast disappearing. Now we are left with great complexity, as you've seen here from my fellow presenters, that includes political, environmental, economic, and health interrelationships. From the Asia's future and the subsequent analysis on, on changing hydrology in, in Asia, we began to recognize that the stability of South and Central Asia is highly dependent on the availability of water, and the future of snowpacks and glaciers are becoming more uncertain. We have glaciers that will be maintained at the higher elevations, but there is grave concern for those at lower latitudes and lower elevations. So there's a, quite a distinction between the different types. And the uncertainty not only relates to the glaciers, but increase, increasing populations and their consistent and constant extraction of water for agriculture and other purposes, plans for infrastructure like dams, the overall degradation of some of the headwater ecosystems, and from the wonderful photos shown today, we can see how fragile they are already in their natural state. And then there are changing monsoon patterns along with the differences in, in glaciers at different latitudes. So where are we today? Given limited financial and human resources, USAID aimed to develop activities that would have multiple benefits. And these included the projects that you've just heard about. The Charis project sought not only to quantify how much water was coming from Asia's high mountains, but also to develop vital research collaborations across all these countries on a topic water for which data was rarely shared. Now we have 11 institutions in eight countries not only sharing the data, but they actually have a common methodology so they can compare apples with apples and oranges with oranges accurately. 
Through our focus on the snow leopard and partnering with organizations such as the World Wildlife Fund and the Snow Leopard Trust, we aimed for and achieved, as you've seen from today's presentations, a quadruple win. We worked to save an endangered species. We worked to improve the lives of mountain people. We worked with them to protect life-giving streams and rivers. And the fourth, we helped establish a platform to enhance regional cooperation across really quite a massive swath of Asia, from Afghanistan to Nepal, all the way over to Mongolia. There is a large constituency in the United States and across the globe who care about biodiversity and wildlife. Snow leopard range countries have exceeded their goal of 20 conservation landscapes and have recognized through an official declaration that the habitat of the snow leopard provides vital ecosystem services like water. Over the last five years, and as a result of the work presented today, countries have improved their snow leopard population surveys. They've worked together with groups like WWF and the Snow Leopard Trust on advancing the science of snow leopards through collaring and camera traps, as well as we saw today working with communities as citizen scientists. Working with communities, we also have reduced their vulnerability to changing water supplies and the loss of livestock through wild animal predation, not only the snow leopard, but wolves as well. So where are we going? USAID's cooperative agreement with WWF US may be ending. However, WWF's model landscape management plans, as we saw in Nepal, will aid the plans of the rest of the 23 snow leopard landscapes. And these management plans address holistically the numerous challenges facing the region, harking back to political, economic, health-related, as well as environmental. Both the University of Colorado and WWF and the Snow Leopard Trust have contributed significantly to filling important scientific gaps in the region through modeled and observed data, analyses, and reports. This information serves a valuable need in meeting the enormous water management and biodiversity conservation challenges in the region, particularly in the years and decades ahead. Notably, understanding if water is going to be available in the right time and the right place and the right quantities and quality is important for humans and wildlife alike. The information that has been generated is publicly available for use by water management, conservationists, researchers, and the public. Organizations like the United Nations Development Program and the Global Environment Facility will continue to work with snow leopard countries on the implementation of the landscape management plans. With Charis and the University of Colorado, USAID will continue to track the volume of water coming from Asia's high mountains. And we're also trying to apply that data to real life, uh, to, to the managers who need that data. So also regarding where we're going, Recognizing that the growth of infrastructure in Asia, which is estimated by the Asian Development Bank to be more than $26 trillion from now till 2030, which is an average of $1.7 trillion per year, USAID will continue to work with multilateral development banks, UNDP, and others to incorporate water management and snow leopard conservation into the region's development plans. With that, I'd like to say thank you for your interest. And, and we all welcome hearing from you and sharing our information and, and data. And also, let's remember how one iconic species can do so much. So happy International Snow Leopard Day. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mary, and thank you very much for your support. I, I have uh, lots of questions, but I want to take it out to you. Um, so let's see what questions, thoughts, reactions you have. Uh, please raise your hands. My colleagues will come to you with a microphone, and I'll ask you to give your name and affiliation and to get quickly to your question or comment. Uh, so were you raising your hand at the back? Yes? Were there any questions, thoughts, reactions? Yes, please. Amanda, this gentleman up here in the front. Let's start with you. Okay. 
Yes, I'm Jed Schilling. I'm the board of the Mountain Institute, which does a lot of work in the Asian mountains and also in the Andes and the Appalachians. So they do the highest, the longest, and the oldest. And on the work that you're doing there, one of the things that the Mountain Institute is doing is promoting what they call MAPS, or medical aromatic plants, that people up in the mountains can grow and earn a lot of money without having to put a lot of land to use so they can raise their incomes in areas we work to $3,000 a year. So this is another option of finding alternative sources of income for the mountains that encourage them to um, be more conservative with the use of the land and, and to protect it. So I'd like your reaction on supporting more of those kinds of things, not just continuing the uh, livestock and other things. And another thing that uh, the Mountain Institute has done is promote more uh, sharing of information, primarily from Peru, on controlling mountain uh, glacial lakes and keeping them from flooding. And you've mentioned the importance of water and the dangers of flooding. So how are you addressing those issues in the work that you people are doing on that kind of stuff? And I'm sure the Mountain Institute would be happy to discuss many of these details much more with you, but I'd be interested in seeing what you think about it. Great, thank you. Yes, this gentleman here. Oh, thanks. Very fast. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tim Scott. I work with the United Nations Development Program in New York. Uh, thank you for organizing and for all your presentations. The combination of your collective passion and commitment resonates so well, and it's just a pleasure to be uh, with you here today. My question is a general one. It's uh, in the spirit of today's event, and it's one that each of you perhaps could reflect on uh, from your different um, perspectives, and it's about the importance of partnerships. So you, each of your presentations has highlighted different types of partnerships, whether it be within the scientific community, uh, with the private sector, with the development community proper, um, and with communities, of course. So perhaps you could expand on some of the things that have worked, why they've worked, some examples, um, for many reasons, particularly because this is so important for taking this work forward. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. So let's, let's deal with those questions. I'll, I'll add a, a couple. So um, I think, Richard, one of the things that, that I was wondering about is, you know, there are lots of challenges in trying to better understand the hydrology in these high mountain headwaters. What, what, do we, what can we be confident about that we know? What do we know for sure? And what, what don't we know moving forward? What are we still struggling with? So what are the knowns and unknowns as we look at this from a, um, a, a data information uh, perspective? Um, and I, I wanted to follow up on your question on, on partnerships. So your question is about what worked. Um, we're always interested in finding out about what did not work. So it's always a little difficult to do that. But where were the, some of the struggles and, and failures? Where, where did, where, what parts of the partnership were really difficult? Um, I think we'd love to hear about that. How are we dealing with flooding and the dangers of water? And what about the question of livelihood, diversity, alternative sources of, of income? So, Richard, let me start with you. Sorry, <clears throat> take a shot at both of those? Or? Uh, one or any of the above. Uh, okay. First one, uh, well, <clears throat> hopefully the, the re these results that are coming out of the Charles Project um, will be well-founded uh, and robust results, and that is where does the water come from? It's interesting that, um, <clears throat> for example, just a few years back, <clears throat> there was a uh, peer-reviewed article saying that 30% of the water in the Ganges comes from melting glaciers. Uh, it was very quickly rescinded because it wasn't even close to correct because, first of all, when people say, for example, 30% of the water in the river basin comes from glaciers. You have to say, well, where in the basin and what time of year? Uh, this is the sort of thing that we've narrowed down with our melt models in these five major basins. What we don't know is, is the future. And you can see, again, the media gets more excited about that because you can have all kinds of alarmist comments about, <clears throat> I mean, go cl clear back, unfortunately, to IPCC when Glaciers will be gone by 2035, et cetera, et cetera. And when the glaciers are gone, there'll be no more water, blah, blah. And, you know, that's just uh, un unfounded. But what's uncertain, uh, as you uh, asked, 
is what really will be happening in the future because as many of you I'm sure know, <clears throat> if you run 20 climate forecast models, the temperatures are pretty well constrained. The, f the precipitation looks like this because especially in this part of the world, there's disagreement in the models on how the monsoon is handled. If you had an increase uh, at this point in the next few decades, if you had an increase in precipitation <coughs> uh, in the monsoon region, say, of the mountains of above the, in the Brahmaputra and, and Ganges, the glaciers would be growing rapidly because that precipitation is going to fall as snow. <coughs> above 15, 16,000 feet, uh, well, I'm, I have a hard time going back from feet to meters, but I think in meters, but <coughs> above about 18,000 feet, most of the precipitation falls as snow uh, year round now. So with increased precip, without any major increase in temperature, it's just going to add more mass to the higher elevations of those glaciers. So you could actually have that kind of feedback to the higher elevation glaciers. <coughs> um, anyway, that's my thought. Great. Thank you. Karen? I will get into the partnership part, which is very interesting. Uh, I think uh, what it works is when you have a very good facilitator without ego, and that works well. Nepal has achieved a zero rhino poaching consecutive years because institutions like some of us have been able to facilitate the process where the army patrols in the park, the, the police controls the trade. The government makes a full commitment for the in, uh, enforcement, and the NGOs can support that, where the governments can not. And then development agencies continue to support that. So I think it's more of a facilitator, depending on the facilitator, how f well that person can facilitate. And I think it doesn't work when it becomes a very difficult person comes into power. And I don't want to name anyone. So that is the, uh, is the most challenging part, where you have a, a d very difficult strong-headed, are unable to listen to the facilitators and try to dictate, and it becomes pretty much a partnership becomes a challenge. And the other challenge partnership has is uh, when uh, similar institutions are competing for similar resources, mm. and that resources become a competition rather than collaboration, and that's when it falls apart. And I think that the learning over the period is n no matter how much you can pull apart, if you lo look for a single cause, like snow leopards or tigers, anyone, then you need to bring together everyone. And everyone has a role to play. And that role would be recognized as credit giving rather than credit taking. And that facilitator has a, a very powerful role to provide uh, giving the credit to everyone rather than taking the credit for yourself. And I think that's the key to uh, uh, any partnership that can not only work, is sustain. Just to give you one example, just quickly, we have a Haryoban program with Judy, the chief of the party, with funded by USAID, a single largest project in conservation in particular, uh, almost, what, 60 million now? Yeah, together. Uh, it's uh, 50, yeah, 58 million, so, and uh, with match fund, I think, can go up. So that also had a very difficult, uh, interesting institutions. Care Nepal as a development agency, WWE as a hardcore conservationist. Not hardcore, but conservative. <laughs> and then we have a, 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 a 10 million plus uh, a, a, a FICO fund, which is advocacy. Uh, and then there's a, a quasi government institution and the government. So basically, a very different primary objective holders coming together to work a project to make things happen. Again, that really took a lot of negotiations and facilitation. I think that makes happen. So quickly on that. So the next one is quickly the uh, TMI part. We are really uh, are very, very grateful that TMI is working on it. We are really trying that. In the, the, with USAID funding, we actually have in Mustang, in my own village, they are growing lots of medicinal plants. It's part of the traditional practice to continue, we call amchis. Uh, and then also uh, so much of a, a traditional healing uh, practice that's coming up, and other chiraito and other things, lots of cultivations being done. And we're really working with the, uh, talking about even body shop and other things with the TMI. So I think this is a very important one of the options that has a high value with high economy yield is still the, uh, the conservation of the landscape uh, in te that protects the integrity and diversity, which is very important. I will end here and it will come later. So Garner, I, I just wanted to follow up on a point that you made. So you talk about you know these hardcore conservation groups and, and other groups like CARE that come in, and, and, and this opportunity for having a facilitator that makes the, the point for partnership and gives credit. What were some of the key messages that you 
felt drove the partnership, that drove the interest? Was it a conservation message? Was it a livelihood message? Was it a looking into our future message? Was it a health and well-being message? What, was it a combination of, of all of the above? Did it depend on who was doing the engagement at that moment? Talk a little bit about that process and the messages and what really drove people to come to the table. Okay. I think <clears throat> the biggest uh, uh, the, the driving forces for that partnership is everyone has a role to play. And the role is being recognized by each one of us and knowing that each one has a role to play. And there's little for everyone to contribute to. And we are understanding that everyone has a complementary roles to play. Some are good in some capacities, the others are good in other capacities. Understanding and recognizing that capacity of each institution uh, and, and bringing it together as a, a, a part. Okay? You have lots of spaces and you cook a nice food in uh, different spaces together. I think that recognition, identification of the capacities at different levels for different institutions, recognition, bringing together, actually you can multiply the if impact rather than doing it uh, or you're all alone. And that has the most powerful message that bring together is more uh, powerful because you can achieve much more with it. And the sustainability also is much more uh, possible mm -hmm. because institutions who are working on it with different capacities, they will continue to work on that same capacity, contribute towards it. So you have a sustainability issue looking for the right from the beginning, not as end, but beginning to end. And so that's really... Sounds uh, like you're fairly optimistic about the sustainability. Yes. Okay. I would say sustainability and uh, complementary capacities. And everyone has a role to play, and there's something for everyone to work on it, rather than one dominating the others, one uh, having heavy-handed on it. So that's the key part of it. Great. Thank you. Harry? Thank you. Well, I'll pick up a little bit on Kana's remarks regarding the partnerships and, and try to answer what didn't work. Um, the partnerships are vital, and I, I think having champions and some sort of uh, what I would call glue in simple terms, but someone who's responsible for organizing and is resourced to, to organize is, is absolutely vital. And to have at least one or two uh, high-level government officials at the, the presidential or prime minister level to get the ball rolling uh, was essential in, in this process. Um, so. Moving a little bit towards what didn't work, I, I, I'm not sure I can find an answer of what didn't work, but what I certainly see are ways to improve efficiencies and next steps and, and gaps and what's needed. Um, on the one hand, regarding the existing process, um, in the very early days, uh, there were um, some conservation organizations that did not want high-level meetings on the snow leopard. And they thought that it was perhaps a waste of money when there should be um, uh, more research in the field. Now, you know, there is a bit of a balance because governments control landscapes and control the, 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 the laws and resources. So we actually put our resources behind the government process because we thought it was vitally important. Now, looking at the government process, and, and I compare this to, to baseball in the U.S. So, so, you know, everyone wants to bat 1,000, but if you only bat 300, you're batting pretty good. And so when you work with government officials, you can't get everything perfect. And, yes, sometimes there's... Um, y y you know, the movement is slower than one would hope. But we're getting there, and we're moving forward. Um, one thing I think regarding efficiencies is, y you know, I, I talked about how the these are complex development challenges, and we had a broad swath of partners here and development organizations, yet it's not enough. In moving forward, we really have to bring in the people who are working on infrastructure in the region. I only pulled one map off the Internet of the Roads. There's a similar one for railways, dams. Um, so I think the next step in, in really solidifying this process is bringing in the businesses and private sector and also continuing to work with the governments to make these landscapes real, whether they need to gazette it or somewhere that the, the process still has to move forward um, to, to put in some of the regulations around these landscapes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, to be aware, conscious, and respectful of the 
of each partner's sensitivities and concerns. And by each partner, I mean governments, organizations, all the way till communities. I think that's the key to move a process forward. And especially in the GSLIP program, our steering committee has a bylaw which says that you have to get decisions with full consensus. It has to be done unanimously. They, there's no voting. It, if, if one disagrees, it doesn't move forward, which perhaps slows down the process, which is fine. But at the end of the day, what really matters is to get things done, the work done. And even if we move little, but if all the 12 are moving, the mass is huge. So the displacement might be small, but the work done will still be a lot. So I think, I think that's the key to it, what really uh, has been really uh, uh, important, especially with the, the Global Snow Leopard program, is our ability to be able to, to, to move with each partner together. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's what I would like to say here. Great, thank you. Yes, let's open it up. Yes, please, this gentleman here. Uh, I'm Mahendra Shrasta. I'm from Nepal, but currently working for a Smithsonian uh, institution. Uh, you know, uh, thank you to, uh, to all, and congratulations for bringing this kind of collective action uh, you know, uh, in favor of Snow Leopard, uh, which we could not have dreamt. Uh, like uh, Kostub mentioned clearly that in a few years ago, we, we, we couldn't dream about this kind of uh, collective action. Uh, my question is to Kostub, you know, as a uh, international coordinator for uh, JSLIP. So, and also, Mary, you know, you brought a, uh, you know, you mentioned about this infrastructure. You know, probably that's uh, something that we need to consider, uh, you know, seriously and, uh, move, you know, moving forward. We need to think about that. So, you know, because, you know, today, you know, I was uh, talking to Rodney Jackson, you know, uh, on a phone call, and then we were talking about, you know, this snow leopard issue and others. So, so, uh, and, and also this infrastructure came into the scene. And then, you know, the concern that uh, we discussed about, like, you know, this road infrastructure, mining, and particularly this, uh, you know, the fence along the international border, because that's uh, causing a lot of difficulties to many species, particularly landscape species, species that has to move, you know, and arrange in across uh, the landscape. So. You know, although we do have, uh, you know, some kind of mitigation measures, you know, that we have been considering about, you know, roads, uh, you know, uh, and, and other infrastructures and mining, but I don't know whether we have any kind of thing, you know, to reconsider about fencing, you know, maybe, you know, perhaps, you know, I don't know personally. And, uh, you know, you know, has that be, is being discussed in your forum? And another question is, like, I saw your, like, 23 landscape. But uh, I see a huge gap in China. So, you know, why is that? So, you know, is there you know, some kind of, uh, you know, reluctance from the Chinese or something? Or, you know, what's the reason? Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yes. Any, any other questions? So I'd like to add a, a, a few others. Um, so we've been hearing a lot about the importance of this third pole and what it means to millions of people downstream in Asia. But what can we do on a large scale to protect water scarcity in these remote environments? So really looking at what it means in terms of water scarcity and what can, can be done. Um, so I think that that is uh, something I'd like to hear a little bit more about. Um, I, I wanted to build a little bit on your question on fences and the impact on species and wondered whether we could talk a little bit more about climate change adaptation. So this has come up in all of your presentations. How, how do communities and ecosystems actually benefit? So, you know, we talked a little bit about community, if we could talk a little bit about, uh, about ecosystems. And then I'll ask you to, to forgive this question. Um, I know um, as, we, as you were going through your presentations, you very much um, talked about why it was important for action to be taken um, 
You know, Kustab, you talked about why countries should care. People need water. There's an extreme event that on the rise. Uh, development does not need to be destructive, um, etc. But I was very, very much taken by this comment of your, your, your individual who said, I will never see your country, let alone a snow leopard, but I'm supporting the work that you do, this 80-year-old. And I wonder for us at the Wilson Center and others who try to make this case to Americans, you know, why should an American care? Why should the average American care about snow leopards or water security or climate change in high Asia? Why is this important um, for us to be looking at and thinking about in the United States? So I'd love to hear any of your thoughts on that. So why should Americans care? Um, how do we look at water security? What are some of the benefits that are accruing to ecosystems and, and communities? If we think about fences, are you talking about the impacts on species? And what's going on in China? Why is there a gap there? So, um, Christine, can we start with you? Sure. Thank you. Right. So I'll start with the the issue of roads, mines, and uh, fencing. Now, you all appreciate we're dealing with these 12 countries uh, where there are friction among some of them. Uh, but then again, the beauty of this snow leopard is that it brings them all together and unanimously agree on issues. There's also another very fascinating fact that, forgive me for saying this, Mary, but donors love the word transboundary. Countries <laughs> hate it because it creates so much of complication in dealing with issues that could be unanimously agreed with and uh, across borders, which can become a big challenge. So what we tried to do, and it has so far, uh, well, it's, it's still initial days, is that we don't have transboundary landscapes. We have uh, transnational landscapes. My part of the landscape remains with me. Your part of the landscape remains with you. There is a small component in the management plan which talks about exchanging information. Now, the, the only way the issues of mines and uh, uh, the issue of, uh, of, of fences can be dealt with is through a very long and a slow process where over time, through these individual management plans, they come up and agree upon mm. the need to not have those in certain areas or to have some measures, mitigation measures that can reduce the impact that they can have. So that's, that's the best answer I can really provide to that. But uh, as, as always, we're always looking for ideas and options if things can be improved there. Talking about China, now it's a cautious country. It's a country which is also known in fact, it's the only country in the world which has the strongest laws against killing snow leopards. Uh, I remember there was an instance where um, a, a culprit was penalized for 11 years of rigorous imprisonment for killing three snow leopards. So, so the idea is that for them, they have slowly got into the pro program. Now they are getting more and more involved. And I'm happy to report that next year, China is planning to host a, uh, a GSLEP technical workshop and hopefully gradually they'll be able to expand. So the, the reason probably why there's not much you see on the map is because they're going step by step. And uh, as the program develops, as they see uh, themselves capable enough of getting larger landscapes secured, I, I'm, I'm very strongly hopeful that they'll, they'll, they'll join, they'll add bigger areas into it. Uh, the last point, I think someone was mentioning about ecosystem services. I just have a very small <laughs> quote from one of our reports, uh, very recently done with support <coughs> from uh, UNDP and uh, other organizations, was that in, so one of our students, she did uh, ecosystem evaluation, uh, she, did, she did valuation of ecosystem services from uh, five different landscapes across uh, four different countries. And the figures that she came up are, are fascinating. Imagine I'm earning $1,000 a year and I'm living in one of these landscapes. The amount of money that the ecosystem is providing me through various services for free could be anywhere between two and three times to 30 to 40 times. Now, these figures, just imagine a mine comes and gives them $5,000 to, uh, to displace somewhere else. But that's one-off, and that's not even 
equivalent to what to a small fraction of what they are gen- uh, what they are uh, making from these ecosystems over a longer period of time so yeah these are the three points i had to mention if i've missed something please let me know fantastic thank you very i i guess i'll speak to your questions on why the american people benefit and why would they should we even care on that i i think um the united states and its people are very diverse so the answer to that question depends on mm-hmm. who. At, at some of the highest levels, um, what we're trying to do and why we're working on this is to prevent and somehow mitigate some uh, a looming water crisis in the Asia region in the future. And any kind of water crisis can potentially and quite highly probably will lead to some sort of conflict on the local level and upwards. Uh, So there's a great concern that any instability in the region not only is in the region, but can trickle and seep through globally. And I think, you know, current history has shown us how localized conflicts can emanate globally. And the military talks about these kinds, the United States military talks about these kinds of events and crises as threat multipliers. And so we're trying to avoid that and mitigate that from happening. You have another level of people, if we still stay in the development sector, who work on humanitarian assistance. Again, any, any decline in water supplies and ability to support the livelihoods of these marginal people. And, and we focused a lot today on the upstream. We didn't focus very much on the downstream recipients of some of these water, and, and Connor referred to that. So any crisis can result in the United States government and the United States people to provide a humanitarian response to probably tens of thousands of people. Then you can look towards the American people as a very generous people, and all we have to do is look at the response to hurricanes, earthquakes in Haiti, and there's a constituency of the American people that want the United States to be doing this and helping vulnerable people overseas. And then there's another constituency that really cares about wildlife. Just look at the American response to the killing of Cecil the lion. Um, There's sometimes a quiet quiet group, a quiet constituency, but they deeply care. And that is reflected by um, Congress and, and the desires and how Congress appropriates funds for biodiversity conservation. Um, so there are many reasons and many different types of Americans. Thank you. Thank you. I just quickly quick pick up with the Mary, uh, the way average Americans care about it. I think it's pretty much that she has aligned. And I think that we have pretty good experience in the UK why the average uh, British care about it. And I think uh, to add, uh, not only adding on what he has said, I really have a request for the uh, Wilson Center and the media to make aware of that. The people are aware of it, but that message has to reach out to people. And that's happened uh, in the UK for three years. It took so wa- for a while. As soon as it reached, and thousands are supporting it. And it's very interesting that little boy who wrote me, saying five-year-old boy, says, you are my hero. I want to protect my pussy cat, and I'm uh, willing to pay three pounds a month from a piggy bank. And that's a powerful message. And that's how you actually, the whole th- messaging has to reach out to people, a different diversity that Mary was referring to. Once that happens, they will know different causes, why they care about it. The similar one I have that, and the other one says, I want my children want to see later. The same thing, saying it later. So I think there's lots of reasons to it. Just quickly on the defensing part, I think it's uh, this whole transboundary is shaping off uh, beyond poli- uh, political putting aside as more of a relationship building in an, uh, the other other diplomacy uh, wildlife. So in, in India, that we had the same thing. You know, they put a fence, they took it out. And same thing, uh, the transboundary landscape in the Tiger, India and Nepal are working together. We had a survey together. And this year we're going to have another one surveyed together. So the Chinese, this whole day traveling, it was very sensitive when you put a GPS scholar traveling to different countries. But it's been informed. The Chinese know about it. The Indians know about it. And the geography where it is traveling are pretty sensitive area. And that's what you are referring to. I mean, those landscapes are lots of landscapes where geographically, geopolitically are very sensitive areas. And they're still letting them know about it. And working towards it, it can happen. And I think that the whole political 
system putting together and moving slowly, steadily, and you need a, a very good facilitator and constant flow of support. I think that's what we're expecting. If you do that, persistent enough to move on it, it's been done. China has banned ivory. I mean, look at that, how much China has made a progress. It's made a tremendous progress in my own professional life for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Protecting tigers in the Amur Hailong with the Russians, to the banning our ivory trade, and all kind of things. I think it takes a while, the larger country takes a while to move things forward, but it's still, uh, once it moves, it really moves fast, and it makes a huge impact. I think we can be passionate enough to have that process moving forward, and I see a good future to it. <coughs> well, <coughs> I'm here to learn about the sort of things that have just been discussed because I don't represent the sort of social, political, economic world. But um, at the same time, one comment that Mary made in terms of uh, cross-boundary conflicts, not too many years ago, uh, a lot of the socioeconomic types uh, around were saying there will soon be water wars in Central Asia. And uh, they haven't happened, fortunately. Uh, but a lot of it's probably a result of the fact that the economics didn't develop any as fast as they had predicted. Uh, National Research Council a few years ago uh, looked into this very carefully, and there were some experts in the room, and basically they were quite pleasantly surprised that, that these sort of conflicts hadn't occurred. But it is a matter of, for example, representatives from Afghanistan said, well, if we hadn't been at war for the last 30 years, we probably would we'd need more water. Um, but I think the results of the CHARGE project can be very useful in terms of better planning and better management of the water resources that are there so that to reduce the chance of these cross-boundary conflicts. And just w one more thing, just so you realize that the physical science world that I'm coming from, when I ask one of my students to please do me an area elevation uh, map of the glaciers of Bhutan, they almost refuse. Because <laughs> a political boundary is like nonsense to them. I mean, of course it isn't, but they think in terms of the, the topography and the river basin, <laughs> they think that's completely insane because there's rivers coming in and out of the boundaries, and I have to tell them, no, you have to do this. <laughs> <laughs> have this, kind of, this type of resistance all along, they just don't, they, they understand if you pull them aside, but basically that's like, no, that's crazy. So, but th the kind of results, actually, we're, d we're doing exactly that. Anything we crank out, like the sort of examples you saw today, we, w we are doing within political boundaries in, in using the same approach, the same methodology, the same melt model. Well, thank you. I think this is a, a perfect uh, discussion for us to have on Global Snow Leopard Day. And, you know, I come away from our conversation with five um, key takeaways for me, at least. I, I was really glad that we started talking about research, science, and collaboration, the evidence base, um, and really looking to the present to inform the future and having a sense of there is a certain degree of uncertainty. There, there are elements that we don't know, but we continue to forge ahead in developing new methodologies, collaboration, partnerships, training. I was really pleased to have the engagement of students and I, why that was so important. I was, was pleased that it didn't stop there, that we talked a little bit about the engagement of women as partnerships in, in those efforts. And we talked a bit about citizen science and the importance of empowering communities to not just collect, but to also understand, use, apply, and mobilize others around the data, the research, the evidence. So I think um, the centrality and importance of, of collaboration around research to inform these efforts was one key takeaway for me. Um, the power of an iconic species, the snow leopard. The snow leopard as ambassador. The snow leopard as an insurance scheme. The snow leopard that gets a five-year-old wanting to protect his pussycat to an 80-year-old saying, I'll never see a snow leopard in my lifetime, but I'm supporting these efforts. So the power of, of that image to mobilize others, to engage, to be really a central part of, of a, a, um, a Th that links to so many aspects that are important uh, for the region. So once again, the importance of, of that image. The question on multi-stakeholder engagement from getting pushback on having a high level um, government support, why that was important, but what it also meant with dovetailing those efforts with engaging at the community level. Um, and I think hearing about what that meant, um, I, I think from, the, from what we heard from 
Ghana, you know, livelihood really represented cash in hand. So that was really an opportunity to bring diverse perspectives and collaborators to the table. And I was glad that we did mention, um, thinking of a next step, that we need to think carefully about how we engage the business sector, the private sector, um, and that there's an opportunity to think more meaningfully and purposefully and deliberately about that. I think one fourth, the fourth takeaway for me were questions around vulnerability. We had a lot of questions and discussion around climate change adaptation. We, we um, saw some examples of migration. We heard of um, new varieties of apples that were being grown, but yet there was a certain vulnerability around that. We talked about developing alternative livelihood models. Um, and, and we um, also had a key question about survival, this key question of survival and adaptation came up. So really looking at vulnerability and how, how the communities are dealing with vulnerability. And then finally, for me, this question of multiple benefits. You know, we talked about species, we talked about the lives of mountain people, we talked about water systems, water management, streams and rivers, and, and that also tied into a broader discussion about ecosystem services. We looked at a regional cooperation and whether we want to call it transboundary collaboration or transnational collaboration, but also the importance of having a first facilitator that is able to give credit and, and manage those power dynamics and bring out the complementarity of roles which will lead to sustainability. So recognizing that there are multiple benefits, but the process to manage that those multiple benefits and be able to present, engage, and empower, and to sustain that moving, moving forward. So Quite a rich uh, discussion. So please join me in thanking our panel. So today's session was webcast live. We do have a video archive of the session, and we at the Wilson Center will be writing a summary of the discussion. So you will be able to reference the presentations, see the webcast, and, and have a look at the summary at newsecuritybeat.org. And I'm really pleased that we have an opportunity to socialize, network, and chat further. So if you just step out the door, my colleagues will um, direct you to our reception. So please stay and continue to ask um, more questions and make sure you meet some of our colleagues here who you have not met before. This is a great opportunity for networking. So thank you. I'll see you in the reception. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, can you hold one, two minutes? I would like to present a snow leopard to you, the Wilson Center. Ah. Uh, is that scary? <laughs> <laughs> a little snow leopard. I didn't know this was happening. <laughs> uh oh, nobody can say no to a snow leopard. Wow. So that reminds you wow. the snow leopard celebration 2017. WWF Nepal. Thank you.